Unlike Ruth, we have been less than faithful. She is the picture of a virtuous woman. She's being held out as that. We have not been virtuous, but we have followed vice instead of virtue. We've followed the way of sin. So we need a redeemer. Not one who will restore our property from out of the hands of another, which is the specific type of redemption that we'll be looking at next week from Boaz, but we need one who will redeem our body and our soul from the hands of the devil. And praise God then that we have such a redeemer. The good news for us this morning, as it is all week, we have a redeemer. And that's what's also shown for us in that difficult passage of Ezekiel 16, where at the end he's speaking a word of judgment to covenant breakers, and yet he also says, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. That is God saying to the people of Israel, but also to us today, I am committed to you, and so I will redeem you. And he does so in the person and the work of Jesus, who is God in the flesh. Jesus born of a woman. Jesus born into poverty, laid in a manger. It's as if, now listen to this, it's as if the man in Ezekiel 16 laid down in the open field and became the child, naked and bare. And then upon growing up, never got dirty. Right, this is Jesus, never did things his own way, always entrusted himself to the will of his father. All that you say, I will do. Never followed other lovers. Always resisted all temptation. Perfectly pure. The picture of virtue. And yet he took on the punishment for our unfaithfulness. He took on that judgment, that wrath, that difficulty of Ezekiel 16. That's the picture. He was beaten, he was disgraced, and he was killed. All so that God could establish his eternal, everlasting covenant with us, the covenant of grace, so that we could be his very own people with Jesus Christ, his son, as our husband, us as the bride, and we're told that he's making us to be his pure bride, and that's the picture at the end of scripture, clothed with the white robes of his purity. So this is the kindness of God, beloved. This is the great kindness that God showed in the first advent of Jesus, his hesed, his covenant kindness and faithfulness, his steadfast love toward us, restoring us through his Redeemer. And at the second advent, this restoration will be complete. Again, this is how scripture ends. Jesus coming again. We will dwell together in perfect rest and perfect union with him. And the wonderful marriage reality that will be the wonderful marriage reality that all earthly marriages only are a dim reflection of. But until that time, as we begin to close, until the consummation of our marriage, God has not left us empty. You, you notice how the chapter ends. I don't want to make too much of this, but I think this is helpful. Boaz encourages Ruth to bring her garment to him and hold it out, and he measures out six measures of barley and puts it on her. And she takes it home to Naomi, and she says, he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. It's like a down payment to Ruth of what's in store for her and for Naomi. Well, in much the same way, Christ has not left us empty-handed, but he's given us a down payment. Scripture uses that term. He's filled us with the gift of his Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Well, we wait for him to fully settle the matter. And so through the Spirit, we can live in faith. We can walk in faith even though we don't see. We can resist the urge to figure things out on our own, like Naomi. We can resist the urge to follow other lovers, like Israel. We can have faith. Right, the essential question, I told you the climactic verse, verse 9. The essential question that God asks of you and of me, he says, who are you? And through the spirit of our risen Lord Jesus, you and I can respond like Ruth does. And we can say to God, I am your servant. Spread your wings over me, for you are my redeemer. And this is what the faithful God is looking for, our faith. 
our acknowledgement that we are in need and that we entrust ourselves to him, our pursuit of his mercy, our desire to be near him, this is what he is impressed with. This is what he will respond favorably to in his loving kindness and mercy. And this is the faith that will be rewarded. And that leads us into chapter 4, which is for next time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your commitment to us, for your intentions, your good and pure intentions toward us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We thank you that we are not empty-handed as we live this life, but we have your spirit, which is a deposit of the greater reality that we will experience in the new creation. We pray that as we walk not by sight but by faith, that you would help our faith to be strong, that we would receive you with openness and humility, and that we would go forward with confidence, and also that we would display the fruit of our faith in obedience, that we would be able to say to you, all that you say, I will do. And even as we fail in this, Lord, even as we recognize we are more like Israel, we are more like Naomi than we are like the perfect pictures we have of Ruth and Boaz. We thank you that the reality is also the case that Jesus has done all things for us, that his perfection is for us, his purity is for us. And so we praise you for the sufficiency of our Redeemer Jesus and ask that you accept our praise in his name for his sake.